Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. We believe the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on today. Please help me welcome to the show Wendy Landry, Mayor of the Municipality of Shunia in the province of Ontario. Wendy, welcome to the show. Good morning, Chris. Thank you for having me. Um, Wendy, I, I know I probably did, uh, I probably mispronounced the name of your municipality, but can you just correct me for two seconds and did I say it right? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So it's the municipality of Shunya. So Shunya is located on the shores of Lake Superior. We butt up against the city of Thunder Bay. We go as far down towards the town of uh, Dorian, Herkett, and Nipigon, in that area of northwestern Ontario. So we're a very large geographical um, municipality that goes uh, about 10 to 15 miles north of Highway 1117 as well. And um, we're, we're a population of 3,200 strong, and we go to about 6,800 in the summer months. So. We will be talking about the municipality a little bit later on in the episode, but I want to talk about you to begin with. And that is our big crux of who these people are who are elected to office in our municipalities. For you, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Wendy? You know, I've I've had this conversation so many different times, Chris, and my duty to serve has been, I think, part of my personality and who I am from a very long time. And, um, you know, from my volunteer days to, you know, um, high school days all the way through to college when I served on on student councils and and you know obviously recognizing as you're looking back that that's really when your political world started right and then as a volunteer and a mom of six in the communities I was um, part of the executive that ran women's hockey in Thunder Bay and I think that that really that world of sports uh, chill, uh kids sports I think really prepares you for the world of politics to be honest with you but where things really got serious for me in running officially elected as a municipal leader in um, in Shunya was way back in 2010. I'll actually go back to 2006, 2007. I um I had I had been working 20 years in corrections and uh, teaching at the college Confederation College for mostly social sciences, so history of Indigenous uh, people in Canada social sociology criminology that kind of stuff and um my work extensively was with youth in conflict with the law so i have six kids three biological three out of the child welfare system and in our municipality it's fairly rural so our properties are large your neighbors are not immediately next door necessarily unless you're more on the lakefront and um my kids all went into school to the catholic school so that means they didn't go to school in the municipality so they really weren't getting to know a lot of people in the municipality over the years and so i um had been uh, volunteering with the um community policing committee and the recreation and and then and involved in recreation stuff and we started talking at that committee level about um you know securing our homes community safety all of that kind of stuff and and I just said to the to the committee members, I said, you know, if you really want to get the message out to families, go through the children, go through the youth. And we were holding our meetings on the main floor of um, basically a, a, a moth not being used recreation center in the municipality. There was cobwebs. I'm not kidding. And um, and we just had this little area on the main floor that we would have our meetings and. Um, I said, you know, we got a recreation center upstairs that's not being used. And I started to pitch the idea of having a youth center. So I got together with three moms, friends of mine who had a um, bunch of kids as well in the neighborhood. And um, we went to city, we went to the municipal council at the time to pitch the idea in 2006 and seven of a youth center that, that us moms would monitor and we would run. And we wanted a, an a in-kind uh, donation of the use of the rec center and um and and go from there and and we were met i think we were a little well, we, i know we were surprised we were met with some controversy and some adversarial um ideas of a very um uh 
re reflective of the demographics of who was involved in municipal council back in seven and eight and, and into 2010, right? It's obviously changed quite a bit in the meantime, but the demographical um, being fairly aged and retired people. So we were met with a bit of pushback from some of the councillors, not all, that basically felt that it was going to become sex, drugs and rock and roll at, oh. a, at this youth centre, right? So we got pushback from it. But at the same time, you know, I went to the to the CAO at the time. I had never been involved in its politics. And I I said, you know, I'm seeking guidance. How do I convince this municipal government to to um, support this initiative? And and, you know, what kind of budget items can is reasonable, excuse me, for them to consider? And not knowing their budget, et cetera. And uh, I felt at the end of the day, I felt like I was set up for failure. Um, so I was, I was met up with, um, okay, sure. Yeah. Pitch this to them. And I think 50,000 is a good, a good number to start with. And I took that, um, at face value and, and I trusted this individual and I went to council with a presentation and basically got, um, laughed off that 50,000 was not something that they would consider. So I was, um, really, um, upset about that. And what I did was I went out and um, I did some funding applications through Community Action Plan of Canada, uh, getting our neighborhoods uh, active. And because I had a connection through policing and my experience through policing, I applied to the OPP Safer Communities and um, was successful for about $35,000 in funding. So then I had to go back to the municipality because they're not going to give four moms this funding, <laughs> right, for, the, for this initiative. So I had to go back to the municipality with this successful funding applications and ask them to basically take care of the money for us, right? And so they did. And and I'm proud to say that that rec center, that youth center is still going today. It is 100% supported by the municipality and the fact that we pay for staff now. Um, we take care of the building, we take care of the bills, and we... Um, and we um, come together and in connectivity of the municipality of people coming together, you know, programs for not just youth anymore, adults in our age to community as well. So that experience said to me that if I'm going to be involved in the municipality, I need to be part of the, the decision-making process. And that, um, that January of 2010, I decided to run for council and, um, and, and I was successful and, and I, I credit that success to that, first time running for municipal council to my connectivity to the community because like I said through children and through families you get to know people and uh, that was a piece that that really supported me in that run in in that, in that initial run and then in 14 um, decided that um, you know we needed new leadership there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> with that opening statement and I want to jump into the first part here because you, you seem like someone who has a uh, a finger on the community, uh, know what your community wants. You were on many boards and then you got involved. Uh, over your three terms as mayor, one term as councillor, or two, two full terms and currently in your third term as mayor, you have probably seen councillors come and go, whether it be in your own municipality or surrounding municipalities. In your opinion, what makes a good councillor? Super good question. And, I, you know, Chris, for the purposes of our discussion, I should add that I'm also, in 2017, I was elected as president of Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association. We were going to so, talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> okay, that's good. But I just wanted to give the perspective of where I was coming from okay. with surrounding municipalities. Okay. So, you know, leading 37 municipalities and having that, um, my finger on the pulse of the communities in our area, you know, we're very far from Toronto. And we need to stick together and, and there's um, strength in numbers, right? So over the years, we've seen, you know, a, a larger number of women run. Uh, something that, you know, I belong to the Women in Politics local group and something that we've been working with at FCM and, and, and AMO and across the province and across Canada is to increase the number of women at the table. But not only that, to change the demographics of the age of the people at the table. And no disrespect to the historical age group of, of the folks that are at the table, because the idea is that the people that have the time to do this are the people that are not working and that are retired. And... I go back to that whole saying that you want something done, ask a busy person, right? So busy people tend to get things done. So I think that we're slowly changing and I've seen a change in, and, and even more this year, because we saw a lot more of our municipal leaders seriously look towards retirement now, even though they're like 
you know, been, been 10, 15, 20 years in municipal politics after a career and retiring, they're now seriously going to retire and, and go spend some time with their spouses, right? So, so we've I, seen I, a I'm bit gonna, of I'm going to push back on you there for a second, Wendy, because in Ontario in the last provincial le- uh, municipal election, which I followed closely because I'm originally from Ontario, there was a lot of acclamations, though, a lot of acclamations. While it's great to have that uh, the diversity around the table, there was a lot of municipalities. I'm not sure with your your community mm-hmm. or your surrounding communities, was there a lot of acclamations? And what do you mm-hmm. think is the cause of that? Before we even get back to what makes a good counselor, are you finding that people are just not interested in municipal politics anymore? So a lot of acclamations because there's a lot of time commitment and there's a lot with social media. There's a lot of negativity that comes to being on council, right? And you have to have thick skin and you have to be able to have that personality to push back a little bit, if you will, but yet still remain um, the the councillor or the or the member of council that's going to receive phone calls, take those phone calls, or even push back on some of the beliefs on, on social media, right? So I think it has a, a, a few things to do with that. I was acclaimed for my second time. Matter of fact, out of my council of five of us, only one and the youngest um, female on our council was the one that was challenged by by someone who was older than her and and retired. And we, you know, I, we really, really were pushing for a younger um, representative on our council. And so she was the only one that had to go through the election process, which was a teachable moment for her. Um, but you, you never want to take I, I don't believe acclamations are necessarily a good thing because you want to have choice, you want to have diversity, and you want people to get out there. You don't want to get lazy and complacent and not an oh good, I don't have to campaign campaign this year. Like you want it, you you as a community, you should want your elected uh, people that are running for council to be out campaigning year after year after year, right? And and to k- keep that finger on the pulse. So. I think a lot of acclamations had to do with the negativity that surrounds and it's become a lot more work. So not only are we advocating for our own municipalities now, but we're having to advocate and constantly review um, environmental regulations, um, proposed legislation that are going to affect our communities and you need to be in the know on an, on a daily basis. So it's um, to go back to your question, Chris, if I could, um, to make a good counselor, um, I think that, you know, you have to, my dad, my dad said when I um, entered politics, officially entered politics, he said, you know, just remember who you are and keep your feet on the ground. And and that is something that has always stayed with me because I, I haven't changed. I don't have an ego. Um, people phone and scream and yell and swear. And I always say, okay, you got five minutes to bitch at me and then you got to offer me some solutions because I really don't know everything. You know, and and they appreciate that. And half the time it's like just a conversation and they just want to be heard. So I I remained honest. So you have to remain honest. You want to remain transparent and you want to remain involved in the community. The further you get from being involved in the community, the harder I believe it is to to be genuine in your decision making with the with the uh, larger people at, at, at your um and on your mind. I want to go back to that first election in 2010 when you first put your name on the ballot. It was the first election that I had also ran in as well back in Ontario for the uh, municipality of Clarington in southern Ontario. And I want to know from your perspective, what was it like going into that ballot box and seeing your name on that ballot and saying, OK, I've put all the chips on the table at the end of the day, wherever the chips fall, whether it be good, bad or ugly, I've done the best I can do no matter what happens. What was that experience like for you? You know, it was <laughs> I was actually so nervous that night. It was crazy <laughs> because, you know, I had knocked on every door in the municipality, honestly, like by myself. My husband would drop me off at the beginning. And some of those, you know, I thought back, oh, my gosh, was I ever um was ever brave because some of those were very long, long, dark driveways and you were going to doors by yourself, unprotected as a, as a middle-aged woman, you know? Um, But I worked hard and I really felt that I deserved to win. I was out literally pounding the pavement and, you know, you kind of, it's kind of like, um, raising your children you you do you you create these children and you and you you raise them to be kind and generous and and beautiful people and then you send them out to the world to live 
<laughs> so in, in comparison to that, you know, you go out and you knock on doors and you put your best foot forward and you'd be honest and you take all the notes of everything everybody says. And then you go, I think the biggest thing for me was seeing my picture and my face on signs all over town, you know, and, and I grew up, I grew up in the, in the area. So smaller town, um, um, east of us and, you know, they, they always drive into Thunder Bay. So they were seeing my signs everywhere too. So that was kind of more of a, of a time for me than it was walking in the ballot room, I think. But that night I remember so well, because we were all at my house, all of our kids, their significant others, my friends, my parents, my in-laws, we were all at the house. You go in, you see your name on the ballot and you think to yourself, it's not up to me. I can't control the outcome. And all I can do is hope that I did my best and give people a choice. But it's really hard to just walk away, check your own name off and walk away and hope that other people are checking your name off too. So the anticipation and the energy in my house that night um, was unbelievable. So, and it, it it was really overwhelming when when I got the phone call to say that I had won. So I'm not sure how the results were displayed in uh, the municipality, but for me in that election, polls would come in because we were a larger community and we'd be, we'd be like going up and then we slow down, go up and then slow down. And at the end of the day, I wasn't successful, but you were. Um, at what point in time does the celebration of I've just been elected turn to now the real works begins. The last mm -hmm. year, which in Ontario in 2010, the election started in January when the election was in October, you you now have to take what you've just learned from the doors, from the people you've just elected, and make the decisions that are best for the community. And the decisions you then make are going to affect people's taxes, people's pocketbooks, people's houses. What time and does that does that wait? of responsibility to make sure you get things right still hold over your head whenever you walk into that council meeting all the time to be honest with you and i remember you know initially in 2010 um you know when the cao hands you all the bylaw books and all the procedural books and the, the budget Municipal <laughs> Act and the budget and all of this stuff it's like drinking out of a fire hose right and, and, you know, as I mentor people that are entering into municipal politics now, I always say to them, you're going to drink out of the fire hose, but you're only as good as the people you're surrounded by. So, you know, just breathe and ask all the questions you need to. You don't need to read every bylaw and everything overnight, nor are you expected to know every bylaw. And I think for me, you know, being a bit of a, of an eager beaver and, and a, um, a professional, not I hold my myself to a higher standard, right? So I, I felt that I needed to know all those bylaws in the beginning, only to realize you don't need to know all those bylaws in the beginning. And that's why you have a really good CAO and, and staff, right? So it, it was really overwhelming at first. But I'm going to tell you, Chris, that when I went from counselor to mayor was when I really felt that um, responsibility to not only not only to the taxpayers and the people in the community, but to my council and to the staff and that bigger picture of being the the captain at the ship and and making sure that you know you're managing personalities, you're managing differences of opinions, you're managing like you know without without muzzling or stifling anyone, you want that ha to happen, but at the same time you need to manage those conflicts, those disagreements, and and still remain. Um, true to who you are and true to the municipality and at the same time uh understand that role that you cannot fix everybody's problems in the municipality because you're a counselor or you're a mayor as much as you'd like to you, you know there's guidelines and, and procedures and process that you cannot get involved in so that that was i think the biggest um realization for me okay this is this i need to steer this ship and i need to do it well because this will be my legacy right and um and that and that was where i uh i felt it uh, a little bit more than in 2010 because in 2010 i had people to look up to and to guide me how much does respect play a role in municipal politics in today's age especially when it comes to the hyperbolic partisanship that we're seeing federally and provincially how much does that play a role in as mayor making sure that while everyone has the right to voice their opinion at the end of the day, you have to make the best decisions for the community, whether you think it's going to be tough or not. 
So a lot of people said to me, you know, what was the biggest learning curve in um, getting involved in municipal politics? And, and actually the question specifically was, what's the biggest challenge of being a mayor? And I, I believe that I know that the two things, one, you, you need a lot of patience. And uh, I'm a very energetic, extra extroverted person. And patience was not always my virtue, but I've learned to be a very patient person and to realize what I can control and what I can't control and to learn how to articulate um, a tough message in an acceptable way. And that goes to residents, that goes to other politicians, that goes to your counselors at your table and your staff and managing the relationship between your staff and and council and you know that constant there but in this day and age it's really about supporting each other as well because the negativity and so the the drastic change of how much um, social media um, adds to the life of an elected official is incredible it's incredible and for women especially you know, it, it, everything from, uh, con uh, uh, not compliments, that's for sure. Uh, you know, the criticism attacks. about how you look, your weight, your, your hair, uh, whatever, right. Where men don't seem to say, give it the same way. They all say, Oh, look at Mr. No tie today, you know, or something so bad like that, but, you know, refer to women as, you know, Miss three chins or look at her hair or whatever, you know? So it's really such a, a, a difficult um, place to manage and you, for your family, because your family never got a, you know, we never ran in the municipal or, or other levels of government in the election. So you're, you know, potentially not while you are exposing your family to all the negativity now too. So that gets really difficult to manage. And I think that that's, um, that's something that you really need to be surrounded by good people and, and hold each other up. I want to ask about the family aspect of the job before we turn to segment two here. And I want to know, because you've been in politics now for almost 13 years, 12 years coming on 13 in October of this year. Have you found the work-life balance uh, achievable yet? Because you as mayor are mayor 24-7. It is a part-time job because you're only there supposed to be for meetings and the cutting of the ribbons, the, the that fun stuff. But technically, the MGA says you're just there to pass bylaws and policies. But if you go to the grocery store or if you go to the post office, you're Mayor Landry at all times. While people may call you Wendy, you're Mayor Landry. You can't go off to Toronto to work. You can't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You are in your community. 24 7 doing your job have you found that work-life balance to say okay guys today i'm just wendy if you want to talk politics here's my card go to call me tomorrow or are you one of those people like you said an extrovert extrovert to say let's talk about politics 24 7 yeah i'm not extrovert extrovert that talks 24 <laughs> 7 and i think i'm a bit of i'm a bit uh sick and I, I say sick in a fun way because i just love politics i could talk <laughs> politics all the time right it doesn't matter which level you want to talk about even u.s politics whatever it looks like right but um yeah i'm i'm not very good at work-life balance i'll be honest with you um the times that i am really good at work-life balance is my summer months and times that i take to get away for a winter vacation but um, in my summer months, I'm, I'm, I'm first nations, Chris. So I, um, I'm actually the first first nations woman to be elected as a mayor in the province of Ontario. So, you know, for me, I go back to my grassroots. I go to the bush, I go to the bush May till November. Um, and you know, it, it's no, no cell service, no anything. My, my CAO knows how to get a hold of me if they need to, in the case of emergency, certain people know how to get a hold of me, but I'm in town and, and during the day, evenings are spent and weekends are spent out in the bush. So I, I can balance it that way. But I'll tell you that um, 2010 to today, uh, when we went to church, my kids took separate vehicles. <laughs> Because they, I'm not, I ended up I'm not laughing at this as a joke. It's just, it's, you're not the first person to say that because I've heard uh, counselors say their husband or wife just don't go to the grocery store with them anymore because they know it's going to be a three hour outing for milk. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and uh, what I have done is gotten a little more strategic about where we go for lunch with family. And, and if, you know, if I go for lunch right in the municipality, then it's almost guaranteed that someone's going to want to bring something to my attention. And and I don't, I'm not that person that says, you know what, can you call me later? I'm having lunch with my family, even though I should, I'm not really, I, I'm not, I'm not that person. And my family knows that I'm not that person. 
so they have accept, accepted that fact that I do talk in the grocery store. I do give people that time to say a few things to me. If it gets to be too long, I'll say, you know what, I got to go, but call me later and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it. Um, but I do work full time too, Chris, because I'm still working. And so, you know, balance where the balance comes in is, is balancing my, my full time job with my part time job. That, but my part time job has full time expectations. So, you know, it'll be six, seven, eight o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. My boss from my day job won't phone me, but other people, there's no, there's no boundaries. They phone whenever. And, you know, my husband will say to me, who are you talking to? And I'll be like, it, I took a call. And he's the one that'll say it's nine o'clock at night. <laughs> you Don't know, you have downtime. So, <laughs> yeah. So I have to work a little hard. I have to consciously work at it. Otherwise I end up getting uh, calls and, and getting brought right into it. So I want to turn to segment two here. In segment two, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is her opinion. Um, Wendy, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the municipality today? One of the biggest issues facing the municipality today is um, our, our community is aging. And at this point, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, long lifers uh, who are the, from the from the community who don't want to move to the larger centers to to age out, you know, to to live out the rest of their lives. They want to stay in their communities. Um, the ability to build either long term care homes or assisted livings is um, is is tough. We we um, I, we have to rely on levels of government to give us funding to do that. It's not really profitable for private developers to partner to do that. Um, you know, so it's a real tough, it's a real tough issue facing our municipality. We have seen, especially with COVID, we've seen a huge influx of people move to the municipality um, where before they would have just summered in the municipality, where they've moved permanently um, because now people can work remotely. So we we have we had a huge influx of people from the GTA move to our municipality and and drive up the prices of our homes. So now you have people that are living in homes that they've been living in for 40, 50 years that are now worth plus 600, you know, thousand who would like to sell, take advantage of the market, but they don't want to leave the municipality. They don't want to go to the city. So that's that's probably the one of the biggest challenges facing us right now. Would you say um, that's the same for the other municipalities that you represent as the chair of the North Northwestern Ontario Mayors Association of Municipal yeah. Association? Yeah, Noma for short, Chris. Norma, yeah. And Noma, yeah. So for Noma, yes. Uh, I mean that's um a lot of our communities. We have um our biggest community is Thunder Bay in those 37 municipalities, then you have the, you know, the smaller ones that are, you know, 5,000 plus, and then you have the communities that are uh, under 5,000. And if you have to remember that Northwestern Ontario municipalities were decimated by the fall of the, of the lumber industry and, and the uh, forest industry, right? So a lot of our towns that were subsidized by these mills in our communities are now relying 100% solely on property taxes to not only fill their budgets, but to try to re, re, um, create themselves as a tourism town or or some a retirement community and and market themselves out to the larger cities like Toronto to bring people to this area to retire tourism you know the hunting and the fishing are big in this area and to really recreate ourselves but at the end of the day our our budgets are, are strained because majority of our communities have been reliant on for large industry um, that has subsidized the taxes. So, you know, there's some that are reaping the benefits of, of uh, a find of, and the ability to mine in some of their communities, but not all. So, you know, now you have people that are living two, three, four hours outside of the city of Thunder Bay. Um, Long-term care homes or, or um, assisted livings are, are less available. And their choice is to move three to four hours or anywhere from an hour like my parents are in, in the town of Nipigon. Um, they still live on the First Nation. But, you know, as my parents will be 80 and 78 and 80 this year. So as their health, you know, as they continue to age, um, they either go into a long-term care section of a hospital or come move to the city or potentially come and live with me or my brothers, right? So it's really difficult for people that 
and and if you look at the city of Thunder Bay and you look at some of the larger cities, crime rates are up, challenges are up with police services. Um, all of our communities, you know, our bigger communities, Kenora, Sioux Lookout, Pickle Lake, uh, Thunder Bay have become hubs. Um, and there's a lot of people that don't want to live in the city, regardless of the scenario. And, and they just want to stay in their own places of comfort. And that's a challenge. So how do you fix it? Because that's the million dollar question that a lot of people are wanting to ask themselves, especially in your communities or communities surrounding you is how do we fix this issue? Because you're right. If people don't want to leave their homes and which is understandable, they have the right to do that. They have the right to age in their homes and retire and, uh, be in their communities until they're untimely passing. But at the end of the day, you as mayor and elected officials have to realize that if nothing changes and we don't grow and we don't bring more people into these communities, then nothing is going to change and we're going to be a stagnant community. And that's the worst thing that could happen for municipalities. Yeah, hundred percent. And so what we have to do is continue to advocate and continue. You see the other challenge for us in Northwestern Ontario is we don't have the numbers to influence provincial government to the same degree as our, our neighbors in Southwestern Ontario. Right. So we have to stay on the radar and, um, you know, I, I always, uh, uh, a friend of mine once told me that, you know, if you go from Kenora, Ontario to Toronto, Ontario, it's about 1,850 kilometers. If I drive west 1,850 kilometers from Kenora, Ontario, I'm in Golden, BC. So four provinces, three time zones, and four planning acts. And we try to, you know, reiterate and constantly give that message to provincial government to remind them that, you know, we are a large landmass in northwestern Ontario. We are the future of Ontario. We have all the natural resources in northern Ontario. <clears throat> and we need to convince them that this is where they need to invest in order to invest in Ontario as a whole, right? And, you know, you need a government that's going to listen. And budgets are challenging. It doesn't matter if you're at a provincial level, federal level, or a municipal level. But benefits are challenging. Sorry, budgets are challenging. And things are going up, the cost of living, the cost of, of uh, fuel, the cost to run a municipality or a business is rising quickly. And so I get that part of it, but we need to stay on the radar and convince people in government that we are important. We need to be, you know, we need to be um, treated the same as our, you know, larger populations in the larger part of the province. And, and this is what we need. And we need that municipal fund, that funding, sorry, to help municipalities build some of these assisted living homes and programs so even if we can't do assisted living because the population of that community is 600 or 500 um then let's look at assisted programming so that they could at least have people going into their homes a couple times a week or once a day depending on what the needs are to make sure that the the shut-ins of the world in the cold winter months are being taken care of you, you talk about being forgotten in some sense. The minister, the provincial government worries about the large urban centers. Um, you have been mayor since 2000. I want to make sure here 14, which means you've been you've gone through two premiers, liberal government and a, for, uh, a progressive conservative government. Is this issue a systemic one that has been through many uh, government provincial governments or is this just a new issue that's coming up? And I'm not trying to ask the political question because I know I want to try and stick on the municipal issue because I can imagine hitting your head over and over again, whether it be one government is one thing, but when it transpires into two different governments then you really start hitting your head even harder well and covid did that too right it smacked us right in the forehead yeah you know you know the loss of all those people in long-term care long-term care homes uh brought the issue to the surface um so that was you know in, in a roundabout way um one of those one of those um I don't want to say blessing, but one of those things that came out of recognitions or, or um, you know, raised the level of attention to an issue that we've been trying to do. Um, COVID did that for us in that sense. COVID did us the favor in the sense of, of realizing that we don't have um, uh, appropriate uh, broadband in the area. You know, COVID raised a lot of our ongoing issues through different governments um, to the surface so that they realized that, you know, through the education stream, for example, broadband wasn't something that's offered to everybody. Cell service is not something that's offered to everybody in Northern Ontario, especially, and our, and our First Nations, right? Our Northern First Nations as well. And, you know, so though COVID really um, uh, was a 
challenge, but it was also a learning and it was a, a mechanism or a pandemic that taught us a lot of lessons. So um, yes, the issues, you know, flow from one government to another. Um, but, you know, I, I'll take you to um, highway safety for an example. So in Northwestern Ontario, we have a lot of two lanes. Um, highway safety is a huge, you know, it was hard to come up with one topic top issue for the communities in Northwest Ontario, because I really do have a list. And and um, highway safety is one of them as well, because I understand that we don't have the numbers and the population for the votes. And, and I get that. I get why that's why that matters. Um, but we need um, infrastructure. Uh, our infrastructures, our people are aging and our infrastructure is aging. And that includes our highways in the area too. We have more fatalities. And, and you know, we presented to provincial government in um, January at uh, Rural Ontario Municipal Association's um, conference. In, in, in a span of two weeks, you know, our highway was closed. Uh, just one accident alone, sorry, two accidents, one on 17, one on 11 outside of Nipigon closed our highways for 36 hours. We're a Trans Canada Highway that moves moves trucks, moves product, moves economy, moves people, and it was so um, it affected our communities so bad that locals couldn't move. The forest industry called me; they lost over three hundred thousand dollars on one truck not being able to get through, and thirty six hours closure for highways to accidents. How is that not a bigger and story? I apologize, but how is that not a bigger story that uh, uh, one accident can cause a thirty six hour closure of the trans canada highway like that's mm -hmm. that's horrendous mm -hmm. and so you can imagine that there was thousands of trucks backed all the way up from the nipigan because nipigan splits into 11 17 okay mm -hmm. that's the that's the junction of 11 17 in northwestern ontario so there was one fatality on highway 11 and then within hours there was another fatality on highway 17 so the opp as i've learned has one individual that can investigate fatalities in car accidents so you know you you, you must know that you know if you have a fatality in an accident they can't move the scene until the investigation's done so that person was in Kenora investigating an accident had to be choppered to Highway 11 outside of Nipigon to do an investigation and then move to the one on Highway 17. So to, at the junction, both areas were closed for 36 hours. Nobody could go. And even in Nipigon, the driveways were blocked by the numbers of transports that were back to back. People couldn't get into their driveways because now they're so squished, they couldn't move. It was horrible. And, you know, we had uh, another, uh, within that week, we had another accident outside of Thunder Bay that closed the, hour, the highway for eight hours. Sistanen's Corner, the junction um, up past uh, Kamenisco and Kakabeka, I, I think we're up to like 30 or 40 um, fatalities in that area in the last year or so. You know, it's just, it's the traffic and and the um, highway safety is a is a very huge issue for us in northwestern Ontario, and it's we're talking about lives, not only people from north lives of people from northwestern Ontario, but people from all over that are that are crossing Canada. I'm going to ask a very poignant question, and I apologize for being blunt about this, but how much of the issues that are facing your communities are provincial and federal issues that you have no quote unquote control over? Uh, percentage um because it sounds like like transportation highways provincial issue healthcare provincial issue schooling provincial issue uh policing policing affordable housing pro issues that are provincial in the realm of the provincial household but you are the mayor and you have to address these issues because you are elected to do that how much of your time is basically spent yelling and screaming and hoping that someone from the provincial government is listening to a person like yourself a lot and of it do you and feel like you're back into that first council meeting when you <laughs> ask for money from the council and just getting brushed off and have to do it your own way yeah you know what um we have made you know some inroads and we've we've had some we've had some wins um you know what I will say is that I've, I this time right now I have more. Uh, I've had I have relationships right now with with ministers in this government than I've had ever, to be honest with you. Oh wow! Um, so so you know what? Very um, I, I, I accolades to in that regards. Um, 
you know, you, you have to play nice in the sandbox. Doesn't matter what color you, you wear. Right. So, you know, I, I, um, I don't, you know, political stripes, you know, when you're, when you're advocating on behalf of Northwestern Ontario and a municipality of Shunya, you, you, um, you just, you have to work with, with who's in government. Right. And, and this one, you know, I think that I, um, over the years, I've developed enough of a respectful reputation that I tell it like it is. And, and I will continue to say the same messaging over and over again. But at the same time, I can also help provincial uh, elected officials on some of their projects that they want right, to do, right? So, so I think that we have right now, you know, when I when I think about the ministers that I've been in touch with and having the ability to have conversations with, um, has has never been that way for me before. So, you know, for example, um, I was on the phone with Minister of Natural Resources yesterday, you know, made it known that I was not happy about an ERO that's out and some of the things and and was questioning part of it. He gave me a call. And, and I think that that's, and, you know, we talked about it and he understood what I was talking about. I think that's fabulous. And, and even right now, we have a lot of mayors who have now gone to provincial government that know what it's like yeah. to be a mayor and to go up against that. But reality is municipalities are creatures of the government, provincial government. We're under the municipal act. We, we are, we, we all need to work together because that's exactly it. Right. So what people don't realize is that municipalities I mean, unless you have you have municipal policing, you still rely on funding. Even if you have municipal policing, you're still relying on funding from the province to meet the needs of your policing, right? Our DSAPs, our social services. Uh, and I should I should kind of backtrack a little bit too, Chris, because aging in our communities is one thing, but I, I should probably correct myself in saying that addictions, um, homelessness, and um uh, addictions, homelessness, and and um, in our in our northwestern Ontario communities are probably m more number one. Uh, and so I'll go back and correct myself. Uh, even though aging in our municipalities is very serious for all of us, the homelessness and the addictions and the treatment centers is something that is really really needed in all of our communities. And so I would I would go back and say that that's number one in our communities right now. I, I know I was going to talk about the community a little bit more, but I want to stick on this topic for a few seconds because I think it's an important one, particularly around addictions. You've been in office for 12 years as councillor and mayor. Has it gotten worse? Yes, very much. And, I, I, and I, I, I'm going to say this probably as rudely as possible, but I mean it with all respect. What do we do? Like, honestly, there are people out there who you can help over and over again, but they're not going to want help. And you can set up remand centers. You can set out set up uh, drop in centers to help people, but sometimes they need to get and get that help themselves, and they need to have that help want it for themselves. So how do you? Well, it's as not them... only that, but it's not as simple as that, though, Chris. Because okay. mental health is, is mental health and addictions go together. Okay, understandable. So so I'm not trying to be rude. Addictions. I'm not trying to be rude. Oh, no, with, uh, I, Wendy. I, I know just, that. I, know, I love this yeah. conversation. It's just, I, you've sparked an interest and I don't know a lot about this subject. And I love the fact that I'm talking to someone who wants to talk about it. So I, I'm greatly appreciate it. Yeah, no, it, you know, um, mental health and addictions is something that, you know, it has, you know, especially mental health, I, I'm so happy that it's to the surface and everybody's talking about it more. Because pandemic you know, has helped that, and, though, has it? Yes, it has. Okay. Uh, again, uh, something that the <laughs> pandemic has helped raise to the to the surface, right? And you know, mental health and addictions is something that you know has kind of been swept under the rug to some degree. So that you know, even if you think back to when someone um, committed completed the act of suicide, it was whispered about. It was never spoken about. You know what I mean? Um, if you talk about um, people that are struggling with um, their identities you know, or um, being which community, how they're identifying and which community they belong to, if it's the LGBTQ2S, um, and I probably didn't get that accurate, but if it's that, like all of those things have now um, been risen and are, are we're being able to talk about. And mental health is, a, is mental health is seriously an, uh, an area that we need to talk about that is historically not being talked about. And mental health and addictions go hand in hand. So the addictions part of it, you know, 
um, it doesn't necessarily mean that every person with mental health issues turns to addictions, but they do, but they do go hand in hand. And we don't have enough um, beds. We don't have enough treatment centers to address the addictions um, uh, pandemic that we have out there. And, um, and we have to really look at who funds that, how do we increase it? Where do we increase it? And how do we actively, um, progressively and positively um, address that, right? So that is something that we really need to to talk about. And we need to um, make sure that it's on the high profile and the government is listening to us. They okay. are. So, um, you know, we made a presentation. There was a group of us at Phnom, uh, NASDA and, and NOMA all made a presentation to the provincial government in January. Again, we made one last year and, you know, we put, we came together with the information from our DSABs, information from our municipalities, information from, from everywhere with statistics. Um, NPI did some research for us and we took all of that to the government to say, here's what we have. Now we need to move forward with this. This is what we need. So we need a hub. We need an addictions hub. We need a place in Northwestern Ontario, um, a, a center of excellence, if you will, to deal with mental health and addictions in Northwestern Ontario. There's cold, long winter months in Northwestern Ontario too. People are indoors. People, you know, that affects everybody's quality of life as well. So we have a lot. Plus, we now have an influx of individuals that are coming to the smaller communities in Northwestern Ontario from the larger communities like the GTA with serious drugs that basically you're pay playing Russian roulette with, right? I know, unfortunately, I know way too many moms that have lost kids to accidental overdoses. And, and that is something that we really need to deal with. Now I'm I'm going to jump in here for a second. Oh, I think I've lost your microphone there. I can't hear you. Oh, I'm just going to jump in for a second. I'm, I'm going to say this. Um, we're going to put some links to some support lines and support phone numbers for people who are struggling with uh, mental health and addiction. I appreciate that. Yeah. Because I think this is a very touchy conversation that we're having right now. And I think there's a lot of people who might be triggered on some of the things that we're saying. So I just want to make sure that there are links to uh, not only the Canadian wide, but also in Northwestern Ontario support lines and support groups that will be in the links below and hopefully if we have the graphics we'll be flashing them on the screen right now i appreciate that yeah for sure because you know it's it's um you know the the drugs that are available today are are killing our our young people are killing our people and our young people and it's um you know i i was talking to a police officer one time who was telling me that he was um he was talking to a a, a dealer basically who um was dealing fentanyl and he said to him, he told me the story and he said to him, like, how are you selling these things that could potentially kill someone? And he said, but they know that when they're buying it from me. Like re re removing any responsibility to himself. So the influx of drugs, guns and gangs in Northwestern Ontario has risen like I've never seen. I've lived in this area my entire life. So, you know, and then you know, you add on to that homelessness um, for folks that are, are dealing with mental health and addictions. And then you have the other piece of homelessness where my own Indigenous people who are suffering from effects of residential school um, systems, all of the social, uh, the social pieces that come with that, and people are finding themselves in larger communities um, because they're going there for services. Like how crazy is it that your um, children of high school age who live in one of our, our um, remote communities has to leave mom and dad and go to high school in Thunder Bay or one of the, mostly Thunder Bay. How, how is that in 2023? Yeah. It, I, I know for myself, I would, six kids, I would never have been able to do that. And I it breaks my heart to think of the families that have had to do that. And some of the things that have happened because of that. And, and it goes back to my comment in the beginning where you, you raise these really nice kids and then you send them out to the world, uh, you know, and, and hope to hack that, that everybody takes care of them too. So some really, really serious issues, Chris, and I don't mean to get, you know, serious and dark on, on the conversation, but those are the realities that we're living with in Northwestern well, Ontario. And, and, but the, here's the thing though, and I'm not trying to, and this is where this, hopefully the show is going to come into play is 
We need to talk about these issues. Municipalities mm -hmm. are suffering about these issues. You're not the first person. Well, you're the first person to talk about these issues on record. You're not the first person who I've talked to, Councillor, Mayor, Reeve, Warden, whatever you want to call them, to talk about mental health and addiction being a big concern to them. And I'm glad someone is. I'm glad someone like yourself is actually willing to say, you know what? I'm going to tell it like it is. And yes, our community is suffering and we need a lifeline here. And we're hoping that the provincial government or the federal government gets off their butts and does something to help us. Because if not, communities are going to suffer. And by suff suffering communities, we're going to have suffering people. And that's the worst thing that we could have. 100%. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, and, and what does that look like? And what's the dollar value? And what is it like? But I always say we are the subject matter experts in our own backyard. Mm -hmm. And and I will forever say that. So, you know, when when policymakers are in Toronto or in Ottawa and making policy that's going to affect our communities, come to us who have lived here all of our lives, that are subject matter experts on our backyards, not and no disrespect to the policy writers out there. But my experience has been eight to nine times out of 10, they've never been to the northwestern part of our province. Well, and not, how do you know? Go ahead. Oh, how do you know how to make policy there if you've never been there? Well, not even that. <laughs> the issues and the policies that affect Halton Hills are not going to be the same that are going to be the need for the policies in your community. Heck, even Thunder Bay is going to be completely different than what your community is facing. Sometimes local policies are better than provincial wide policies. Or work together, right? Or, or yes! because we because because we always say one size doesn't fit all. That's that's Noma's saying to to the provincial government, right? One size doesn't fit all. And and now we've got our southern friends saying the same thing because I'm also on on associations municipalities of Ontario, right? So now we're saying the same thing. And and what works in Halton Hills doesn't necessarily work in Cornwall. So you, you know, and thank goodness we have a lot more mayors that are running for provincial government that get that. And, and, you know, and the, the more representatives we have with the government of the day in Northwestern Ontario, then the more voices that we have, right? Um, and represent, and even if you're in opposition, you have a voice. So we hope yeah. that, you know, we're always trying to make sure that they're getting the messaging and the work that we're doing to, to advocate on behalf of our communities as, as a whole. And, but I mean, like, you know, with NOMA, we, we always say we come with solutions. We don't come to complain. We always bring solutions with us. And so, you know, there's, there's, you were making headway and we're making progress, but we got a long way left to go. And I'll leave you with one thing. Per people services has fallen on municipalities where it used to be, it used to lie with provincial government. Yeah. If provincial government took back people services, and we're talking EMS, we're talking social services, policing, if they took back those services, municipalities would be able to do a little bit more because our levies all for Shunya, for example, our levy is around a million dollars for social services. So, you know, and it's based on assessments for some, it's based on pop, uh, our levies differ for the health units for, for different things. But um, I think if we, you know, look at putting police uh, people services back in the hands of the, the province, municipalities would have a little bit different conversation and a little bit more leeway on their budgets. We are coming up to the hour mark and I have one last segment I want to talk about. And I'm just going to ask two final questions because I think I have taken a lot of your time and I'm, I'm so happy that you're willing to sit down with us and talk about your community, but some of these issues as well. But I want to turn to tourism because I love tourism. I love being a tourist. I, I try to spend my economic dollars in Canada and I've made a pledge. If you come on my show, I'm visiting your community. I'm going to be visiting awesome. some of these tourists. So later on this summer, I'm going to be driving with my husband across Canada and we're we're going to be stopping in Shunia. Shunia. I will get it right by the end of this interview. Shunia. Shunia. Yeah. Shunia. I will be, I yeah. will stop, be stopping in Shunia later on this year. So I'm looking forward to potentially meeting with you and potentially grabbing a coffee during the day. So you're not, I'm not taking you away from the time. Oh, that no you're worries. No board. worries. Any, I'll but, make time. I'll make time. Uh, Wendy, what are some of the tourist spots that people should talk, uh, should stop and see while they're in Shunia? 
Well, Chris, I'll tell you that Lake Superior is a beauty, right? So we have the sleeping giant out at Lake Superior. We share that obviously with the city of Thunder Bay and between, you know, what's good for the city is good for the, for Kashunia and, and um, vice versa. You know, we have some great parks. We have some um, great camping um, places to go camping, like Sleeping Giant Provincial Park. We have a lot of hiking trails. We have a lot of fishing spots. We have, you know, the tourism in this area and the tourism um, uh, agencies, both for North Superior uh, Tourism and the City of Thunder Bay, have a lot of tourism available on their websites. We have everything from bikers to hikers, you know, the Terry Fox Monument. We have a lot of history in the area with the history of Indigenous people in the area. Um, you know, I'm I'm uh, on the I'm part of the Robinson Superior Treaty Territory of uh, the Red Rock Indian Band. You know, there's um, the Fort William Historical Park that tells the history of the fort in um, in Thunder Bay and the relationship with our local Indigenous people here. There's a huge history. Um, winter, there's a lot of skiing. There's a lot of snowmobiling. There's a lot of ice fishing. So it really doesn't matter which season you come. We absolutely do have a lot to offer in the area. Well, I'm looking forward to visiting later on this year, but I want to end on this question, Wendy, and it's the most important question, I think, in the entire interview, because it gets to know your community in one answer. What makes the municipality of Shunia a great place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Only one word? Only one an answer. So take as long okay. as you want. Okay. But this yeah. is the one answer that sort of defines what your community is about. So what makes it such a great place to live, work, and play? Well, the people. The the um, Our, our, our community is so diverse that we have rule and we have, uh, you know, more more density in some of our lakefront properties. Um, and and the, the, the um, living on Superior, like, the area that we live in, you know, has just so much to offer. Lake Superior is a one of the big, I think it is the biggest Great Lake. And, um, you know, it's a freshwater. And, you know, that that is something that we're really proud of. And living on Lake Superior, you know, I've met people that live on the other side of Lake Superior too, down in Michigan, down in Minnesota and in that area. And they, you know, they have a, they have a lot to talk about too when we talk about Lake Superior. I want to thank you so much. I want to thank, thank you. you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, taking, I know I said 45 minutes, but almost an hour oh, of, out, out of your day and doing this. That's my fault too, though, because <laughs> I'm a chatty patty. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. Be a very bad interview if you weren't. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media and go have a conversation with someone for at least five minutes a day. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.